Thank you very much again for joining us tonight. Joseph and Joseph, over 100 years of landmark architecture. And I wanna introduce Steve Weiser, our speaker, the eminent Steve Weiser that in Louisville is a name that we all know. Uh, FAIA is an architect, historian, and author. He has written over 10 books on Louisville architecture and history and is president of the Louisville Historical League. Steve is a fellow with the American Institute of Architects. He has given previous Filson talks on architects John Baker Hutchings, Jasper Ward, and William Dodd. After Steve's remarks, I will return to moderate questions and answers from the audience as time permits. And so please join me in welcoming Steve Weiser. Thank you for that introduction. And now I hope to live up to that. Yikes. But anyways, it's been a while since uh, we've given a Filson talk here. It's been several years. There's something happening in the last few years that have prevented us from doing this. But anyways, hopefully you've seen my bio here. So we'll, by the way, I think we have about two to three hours here. Is that correct? No, we will be going very fast. I am on Facebook. I just posted some photographs of the audience here on Facebook. So uh, uh, that's where I usually announce when I'm speaking and doing things. I've written several books, as you just heard, and we have several copies here if anyone's interested afterwards. For some reason, ghost books do very well. This is my most popular book. I, why? I don't know. But I try to, hopefully, uh, those that read this also get a lot of history of Louisville in it as well. And then I did, this is my most recent book I did a few years ago, Louisville Sites to See by Design, talking about the, a lot of the architecture and history of the city. And you may have saw in the Courier Journal recently, uh, I was involved in... Uh, not spearheading, but encouraging and advocating for the restoration of the Paget House. I was on the Waterfront uh, Development uh, Design Review Board for over 30 years. We made it a point to make sure that this building got preserved. And as you know, over the last 30 years, it's steadily declined. But I kept harping on the Waterfront people, hey, what's going on? Where is it at? Let's keep it going. And finally, they uh, got tired of me bugging them and they restored it. So Thank goodness for all that. If you've not been down to see it yet, there's a little display there if you don't know much about the Paget House, but I encourage you to go down and take a look at it. Uh, as noted, I've given a number of talks here on architects over time. And I've helped to install a lot of uh, historic markers around town. Whenever someone contacts me wanting to install a historic marker for a building, I make sure that the architect is recognized and we've done over 20 of these throughout the community. And so here we go. Joseph and Joseph, over 100 years of landmark architecture. I wanna thank um, all the various folks that you see there. Of course, the Joseph and Joseph staff with Cash Motor, Fred Joseph, as mentioned earlier. The Filson staff has been wonderful. I'm not sure if Jana Meyer is here or Abby. There's Jana over there. Is Abby here as well? Abby's over there, good deal. Thank y'all for helping me out with all of this. I'm not sure if Christopher White is here or not. Christopher, he's not going to raise his hand if he is here. But anyways, all these various folks that have assisted me. And, and Scott Scarborough, thank you, Scott. He's running the uh, technical equipment behind us there. So there are going to be some quizzes here tonight. And the staff of the Filson and Joseph and Joseph are not eligible to participate in these for obvious reasons. So here is the first quiz question. And I'm gonna try and pick out whose hand goes up first, okay? So John's already put his hand up. Well, that's cheating, John. So what Joseph and Joseph building is in the Filson's Forgotten Foundations exhibit? Okay. That is correct, the reality. So you get quiz question number one. tonight, so. Um, you get the first selection of which book you want. But yes, uh, the Rialto is there, as well as the uh, uh, the Hebrew Association building, Young Men's Hebrew Association building, I think is the name of that, and the Rialto. Both of those buildings are in the Forgotten Foundations. And hopefully everyone here has been to the exhibit. It's phenomenal. I think it, what, it ends on what, September the, what date does it end, uh, Jana? The 23rd, I wanna say. September 23rd. So if you've not seen it, please do so. 
So uh, this uh, was published by Business First a while back, talking about the uh, the age of architectural firms here in town. Uh, Luckin and Farley uh, was this, is the successor firm to White Henry Whitestone and DX Murphy that you see up there at the top. But to me, the 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 one that deserves the recognition for the longest serving continually uh, organized firm is Joseph and Joseph, which was founded there in 1908. We'll discuss that later as we go through. Um, there hasn't been that much. One reason why I wanted to do this lecture is there's not been that much history on Joseph and Joseph. I did not know that much on Joseph and Joseph. And so I wanted to do this talk to find out more on them. Uh, there is uh, some talk here in the uh, Jewish history uh, book on Louisville. They have a page on Joseph and Joseph within that. But in the Encyclopedia of Louisville, we have a lot of architects mentioned in the book, but there is no bio of Joseph and Joseph. Why? I have no idea, but uh, they should have been represented in that book. Um, here is a photograph there at the J&J &J office. That's Cash Motor there, if you're not familiar with him. Um, but they've got this wonderful historical record of their firm in their office, which I think every architectural firm should do. Just phenomenal. There is even a Wikipedia page on Joseph and Joseph. And they list a bunch of buildings there. And I don't even think J&J &J knows who organizes this, correct? They don't even know who put this together. But um, anyways, it lists a lot of their projects. But I also keep a database on architecture firms here in Louisville. And I even have more than the Wikipedia uh, entry has. Um, I started this a few years ago when people constantly would ask me about who so-and-so architect was. And I got tired of answering the same questions. And so I started this minimal database of just a couple of firms, which has since grown into over 3,000 Louisville buildings that I maintain. Uh, this database is an Excel spreadsheet. It's very searchable. Uh, it's located here both at the Filson and at the Louisville Free Public Library. So uh, if you're interested, I'm constantly adding to it. It's a uh, uh, one of those OCD sort of things that I got myself involved in. So uh, let's start off with the uh, Joseph and Joseph history here to begin with. We talk about Abraham Joseph coming here uh, from Germany, uh, and he marries Johanna Myers. I do not know the exact date of that uh, wedding. Um, and then um, Alfred was born in 1878 and his brother uh, Oscar in 1880. But the tragedy soon thereafter happened. And it's amazing to me that they were able to do what they've done based on this next thing I'll show you. Their father died at the age of 32. Just phenomenal. So Johanna had to raise not only those two boys, but two other siblings. There were four boys in that family. And uh, so there, a uh, little history on them. And they were all very accomplished as noted there about Edward uh, and his violin. So anyways, it's phenomenal that he had very successful careers and all. Their father died of an illness. A little bit more of uh, the architectural history of the Josephs. Alfred went to Mill High School. Uh, Oscar went to DuPont Manual. Um, Oscar uh, went to University of Michigan to get his ar architectural degree. And Alfred went to work for several uh, uh, architectural firms. One of them was this one here, a McDonald and Sublessi, if I can say that name right. This book is phenomenal, the one with the green cover there. The Filson does have an actual copy of it here that I was able to look at. And uh, it it's sort of their uh, portfolio in, in which they could tell clients of the type of work that they did. And it was just phenomenal what they, the, the type of projects that they worked on. So McDonald and Sibilesi. And this was a uh, firm photograph here. Um, Al Joseph is there in the center and uh, uh, J.F. Sibilesi is there on the far right. And why Al Joseph is in the center, I do not know, uh, but, uh, and Ken McDonald is not in this photograph for some reason. Uh, this is another project that the uh, McDonald and Sublessi firm did. 
Notice it was the design from the Presbyterian Theological Seminary, and we'll discuss that here a few minutes later. By the way, I do not know what happened to Sublessi. He disappeared um, around 1905, 1906. I know there's a bunch of Sublessis up in Cincinnati. I did some research to see if he was up there. Is actually there's a John Sublessi who lives up there. So I'm, my guess is he went to Cincinnati or some other community or left Louisville, but uh, he disappeared at some point. So then uh, a little work about uh, Oscar. He worked for several firms in Ohio, then uh, with the Ellen and Railroad. Uh, Alfred married Helen Roth's child, and then Oscar married Stella Furman. And then Alfred and Oscar both were employed by Ken McDonald and William Dodd uh, in 1906. They were both in the same firm together. And uh, as noted, uh, uh, McDonald and Dodd are, are accredited for the Presbyterian Theological Seminary project. But as I just showed you, uh, McDonald and Sublessi actually had that commission, and McDonald brought it in when he became partner with Dodd. And here's a representation. So I put the rendering of it up there, and you can tell there's some similarities to it, but there are some fairly significant uh, alterations that they did to the project. And so, uh, again, Al and Oscar are working for McDonald and Dodd at this time. Uh, they worked on the Stewart's department store and the Lincoln building. That's what they both look like today. Uh, Stewart's is now the Embassy Suites Hotel and the bank building, thank goodness. You know, well, unfortunately, the uh, Lincoln building was demolished in the uh, early 1970s and replaced with this horrible bank building. And now that's being demolished pretty much with an extreme makeover and Churchill Downs is putting a gaming facility in there now. But uh, anyway, so it's a little history there. Um, McDonald and Dodd also worked on the, what's called the second Atherton building there, which still exists to this day, but you would never recognize it because it looks like that. Yeah, not good. Hopefully one day they'll take that metal facade down. Uh, they also worked, uh, McDonald and Dodd worked on the Frankel Chapel at the Adeth Israel Cemetery, or the Temple Cemetery, as we call it. Uh, and my guess is that the Joseph uh, folks had a lot to do with getting this commission there at the uh, Temple Cemetery. This is what that uh, chapel looks like today. It's in the far back section of the uh, Jewish cemetery there off Preston Street. Um, McDonald and Dodd is also credited with the Temple at Beth Israel uh, building, which is still existing there on the South Third Street. And again, I'm pretty certain that Joseph and Joseph had a lot to do with bringing this commission into the firm. So more on the um, firm history. So in 1908, they decided to strike out on their own. Uh, 1912, Al Joseph Jr. was born. Um, and then also in uh, 1912, late in December 1912, William Dodd uh, relocates to Los Angeles at the age of 50. And in 1913, Oscar was born, uh, the Junior was born, Oscar, they call him Graham, uh, but Junior was born. And Ken McDonald relocates to San Francisco at the age of 61. And this was phenomenal for the firm growth when their two mentors, Dodd and McDonald decide to depart Louisville, all of a sudden, Joseph and Joseph has access to all these great clients that Dodd and uh, McDonald are leaving behind when they move to California, when they go west. And I think that gave them an immediate credibility and momentum to do the type of projects you're about ready to see that they were able to accomplish at such an early firm age. Um, their first office was located uh, in what was called the commercial building, which was at 211 South 4th. We're not exactly certain. Some think it was located here in the Lincoln building. I think it possibly was located across the street where the Todd building was, if some of or the Vienna building, if you all know where those buildings were on 4th Street there. But anyways, they were located at 4th and Market in that vicinity was their first uh, office location. 
And here's a photograph of the key uh, principles of Joseph and Joseph. On the um, far left, you have Al Joseph Jr. In the center, or the next to him, is Senior, Al Joseph Sr. Then Graham Joseph Jr., who is standing there pointing at the blueprint. And then his father, Oscar Joseph uh, Sr., there just to the right. I think this photograph would have been the late 30s or early 1940s. I don't have an exact date on this photograph. One of their early projects, this was in 1908. So again, think of this. They had just opened their firm and all of a sudden they get these great commissions. Um, the Kentucky State Fairgrounds building, which is previously located in far west Louisville. I think the Wayne Supply Company now occupies some of these buildings. But uh, can you imagine that, getting that commission back? I do not know their connection, but I'm certain it was through uh, some of their former clients that they had through McDonald and Dodd or Sublessi uh, that and how they got that commission. Another building that they did. Then uh, they did this uh, building for the Shelby County Courthouse in 1912. And you look in the upper right-hand corner, I can tell you how they got that commission. <laughs> Family connections always help, don't they, architects? I see a lot of architects out there in the, uh, it's who you know sometimes how to get these commissions. But notice the, the design of this. So how did they come up with this design? Well, Here's the Muhlenberg County Courthouse that McDonald and Dodd designed in 1907. You may start noticing some of these similarities here. And then this is the, what's called the Bartow County Courthouse in Cartersville, Georgia, by McDonald and Sublesi in 1902. Have you started noticing any similarities? Well, look at that. The only thing I really noticed is that uh, Joseph and Joseph spaced the columns a little bit differently there on the front. By the way, if you look in the, uh, the gable there in the uh, triangular section of the uh, Shelby County Courthouse and the Muhlenberg County Courthouse, that little symbol there is the same, same detail. So, and they pretty much detailed the windows and the cornice lines and the columns all pretty much the same. So a little, little plagiarism there, let's say. But anyways, very beautiful courthouses. And of course, uh, they were involved in the Elks Club, Athletic Club building there, which we now know beautifully as the Henry Clay building in 1924. Beautifully restored by the Wayland Partnership. I'll give a little shout out there for some people in the audience. Uh, they also did this phenomenal building, uh, the Cozier Hotel and Temple 1924, on, which still exists to this day. That's what it looks like today. The Ellsby Building in New Albany. It was um, home to the German American Building, German American Bank, and Samuel Ellsby was the developer of that and the proprietor of the German American Bank. It still exists over there, and I think they're undergoing a restoration currently. But beautiful building in downtown New Albany. Some other New Albany buildings uh, that were. Uh, designed by uh, Joseph and Joseph. And again, when you think about this, this was before the Second Street Bridge was built. They had to take ferries across the river to do these commissions. Again, I do not know who their uh, patrons were or their clients, but uh, to go across the river and do these type projects uh, was pretty phenomenal for the firm. The Republic Building, they were at Muhammad Ali in 5th, 1916. It still exists to this day. Just spectacular large-scale buildings for such a young firm. Highlands Baptist Hospital, 1924, it still exists. As of now, it's still there. We'll see what happens in the future. Cozair Children's. Okay, more quiz questions. So, you, so everyone wake up. Um, who was J. Stoddard Johnson? And what does the J stand for? 
Anyone have any questions on that? And Phil, some people are not able to answer this. Yes. No, well, that's a good guess though, good guess. So there's not to me, it's not John either for what it's worth. Not Joan, no, Jerry, no. No one knows who uh, Jay Stoddard is, Johnston with a T, sorry. What's that? Does anyone not know who, who he was? Joshua is very good, so I'll give you one, Joshua. But no one knows who Jay Stoddard Johnson was. Come on, we were here in the Filson. Yes, way back in the back. Yes, you. Yes, you. That is correct. That is correct. And he was president of the Filson Historical Society. Joshua. Hopefully my quiz questions will be easier next time. We'll see. Okay, uh, some more buildings that they did. Of course, the Knesset Israel Synagogue, 1930, no longer exists. That's it today. They recently demolished that due to a fire that happened uh, a couple, uh, a year or so ago, I think. Very sad. Both those buildings cost $350,000. I don't think we have those uh, bids today, do we, Joseph uh, Cash? Wouldn't you like to build those for that amount of money? Wow. Prices have changed. Here we go, Young Men's Hebrew Association building. Kirby's Paint. Historical photograph of it. Okay. Uh, this I did not know Joseph and Joseph had died, but I... Went back and checked my notes. It was in my database, believe it or not. Yes, they did do this. Just a phenomenal high-rise building. Look at that. Fourth and Market, northwest corner, fourth and Market. Next quiz question, what stands there now? Right, right, well, who said Agon? Yes. We call it Agon, but it's actually 444 West Market. So let's uh, discuss a little bit more uh, some of the residential buildings that they've done. This is a little bungalow, and uh, I love it when I do research and you put in certain names in the Courier Journal database and things pop up that you didn't know they did. Like here's a little real estate ad, that last entry there talks about Joseph. They even put in there, it was designed by Joseph and Joseph Architects, who knew? I wish more real estate ads, especially today would do that, make my job a lot easier. This one's on West Ormsby, just right down the street from us here. It's right across the street from Christopher White's house. That's the only reason I know this. I don't think Christopher is here, is he? Okay, I invited him, but he's not here. Uh, of course, the uh, Kirf Kirfee Farnsley Shear House is what I call this now. It's there uh, in Crescent Hill, right near the uh, Peterson Dumanil House. And if you haven't got your tickets yet, it's going to be on the Filson Annual House Tour on Sunday, September 25th. Got it circled there. They just did a big expansion to this house. And uh, so just love all these houses. The, the Anchorage houses, I really want to go see. So if you haven't got your tickets, this is a phenomenal tour. These are great houses. I've been in most of these. And uh, it's well worth your time and effort to do this. Is that good enough, Dick? Very, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is called the Fritchner House. Uh, is Al Spots here? Oh, there you are, hey, Al. Good deal. So this is uh, Al Spots. And it recently sold, is that correct? Yes. Got some interior photographs of it. Thank you for inviting me over and uh, taking some interior photographs of it. Very well-built house. Everything in it still pretty much functions and operates. Uh, there's this little uh, plaster uh, signature here that the, uh, the artisans did back in, I think it says 1916 even though the house was built prior to that. But uh, it's kind of neat to, to discover those type of things. 
over a hundred years ago, those folks installed um, wall covering in this house. Now, I would love to know if this house still exists. This was a proposal in 1935 by Joseph and Joseph of a modern home, a spec home is what they called it in the article. They were going to build it. And uh, to my knowledge, it does not exist. Mike Cook, are you familiar with this house? I've never seen it either. If it does exist, let us know. We love to know. It's very similar to the house over there on Grinstead Drive, but it's not, it's definitely not that. But um, boy, uh, and again, this was during the depression when all this was done. I'm sure they're kind of like sitting around twiddling their thumbs. What are we going to do today? Well, let's design a house. And I was mentioned earlier about some of their large scale residential projects that they built. Yeah, the uh, what the Commodore cost eight hundred thousand dollars. I wonder what it would cost today to build. Yeah, prices have gone up over the last hundred years. And there was this nice article in the um, Jewish History of Louisville talking about um, the the Commodore had a lot of uh, Jewish residents within it. It was managed, I think, by a Jewish superintendent. And so this was a nice article talking about uh, the Commodore and all. And more residential. And this is Al Joseph Sr.'s home where he lived. And I, I don't, Cash, I didn't verify this, but I take it Al designed this house. I don't know that for a fact. And Fred Joseph, who's monitoring this on Zoom, he's probably screaming at us right now saying, yes, Al designed it. But I take it he designed it. And then right next door to this on Top Hill Road was Al Joseph Jr. designed a nice modern house right adjacent to it there. Nice article about it in the Courier Journal. And that's a photograph as it looked today when I went by to take a photograph of it. Very modern home. I'd love to go inside this to see how well it laid out, but I've not had to, didn't go up and knock on the door today. But so anyways, Hundreds of people pass by these houses on a, on a daily basis. They're just off Lexington Road. You can easily see the Al Joseph house as you go off Lexington Road. Now, uh, the uh, Junior's house is set back and it's landscaped. You almost have to go on to the front lawn to view it. But the Al Joseph house, the senior house, is very uh, prominent there at Lexington Road and Top Hill Road as you go towards uh, I-64. So next time you're on Lexington Road, just look to the right as you're going towards I-64 and you'll see it. So distilleries, uh, Joseph and Joseph, I think has become the architect of the most prominent distillery designers here in Kentucky and perhaps the region and maybe the world. But um, one of the projects they worked on was the Forester Center there at Brown Foreman. I think um, Henry um, Weiss was it also a part, Harry Weiss, Harry Weiss was also part of this project. It's a beautiful project. Each time I go by there, I check it out. They recently did the Bardstown Bourbon Company, which is there in Bardstown. Beautiful facility. This one I just love. I, I just phenomenal. The Mitster's uh, Distillery there. Hopefully everyone's been able to go. Don't you just love distillery tours? They are just phenomenal. So there is what it looks like now. That's what it looked like then. We are so fortunate that the Fort Nelson building was saved and uh, thank goodness for Joseph and Joseph for bringing it back to life. It's just phenomenal. Another distillery project. Yeah, Angels en Envy, a great distillery tour here as well, if you've not been there. I love their tasting room. It's one of the best tasting rooms they, of all the distilleries I've been to. There's a photograph of it at night. Also worked on the Stitzel Weller Distillery there in Shively. And one of my favorites, I've always loved going whenever I'm near Four Roses, I always go back and check this out. Love Four, Four Roses. I love the Spanish Baroque style architecture. They just recently completed this nice gift shop there. Me and my wife, when we went on the uh, bourbon trail back in 
I think it was 2006 or seven, there were only six distilleries on the Bourbon Trail. How many are there now? I think there's over 30 or 40, maybe, a lot. Theaters, Joseph and Joseph did some great theaters. This is the Royal Theater, West Broadway. It still exists, although you would never recognize it, as you'll soon see. Oh, that's nothing. Wait till you see the next one. I understand the big archway still exists behind that facade. Maybe someday someone will buy it and restore the archway. The Aristo Theater, that's what it looks like today. The Grand Theater over in New Albany, what it looks like today. Yeah, a lot of these did not age very well, did they, unfortunately? A lot of modernization went on. Speaking of modernization, here's a good example. The National Theater, some more photos of it. It's what it looks like today. Yeah, go figure. Just think of that sucker still existed today. Wow. And of course, my favorite, the Rialto. I'll never forget my grandmother taking me to see the sound of music here. So many great movies. Joseph and Joseph still has the uh, original linen drawings in their archives. Who all went to the Rialto? Yeah, just, you'll never forget that place. It's just phenomenal. Sorry for the blurred photograph there. This is a nice um, article that was done on Joseph and Joseph uh, when they designed the Rialto. And also talked about all the other theaters that they had designed in their career. This marble staircase, now I have always heard that the marble staircase was salvaged and saved. Does anyone know any of the history of that? What happened to that? I've always heard that it was saved, but whatever happened to it, it was probably cut up and turned into mugs or something. I don't know, but who knows? But beautiful marble. I remember going up that. Rialto, it's what it looks like today. Very sad. Of course, when they tore it down it for about the next 10 or 15 years, it was an asphalt parking lot before they built the parking garage. The Broadway Theater, and it still exists, thank goodness. That's what it looks like today. That's what it used to look like on the interior. It's still there though, believe it or not. This is what it looks like on the interior today. They've leveled out the floor. They use it as a, a, an event venue. You can see this huge, massive balcony that's above it there. And I'll show you here. If you go up, and by the way, anyone can go down there to the Broadway Theater. They'd love to show it off. So you walk in there and go up, go up to the second floor and look out. And by the way, uh, did anyone participate in our Forgotten Found out Foundations trolley tour? Yes, when we were there, we actually got to go and see this uh, theater. We were up there and got to look at it. Some of the projection equipment still there. There's our uh, Filson group. That's uh, Terry Zink giving us the tour. Um, Joseph and Joseph did a lot of healthcare related projects as well. Uh, of course, Jewish Hospital, they were very involved in for decades there. Uh, Park Duval, uh, Family Health Center, the I, uh, Lions Eye uh, facility, and then Four Courts a Senior Living facility. And I love it for all the architects in the room here. I love it when you all put your name on your renderings. When you pop, I'm, our architects are always telling me, well, Steve, we never get credit in the newspaper when our renderings appear. Well, if you put your name on the rendering, it will appear just like you see there. And this is a nice article um, about Al Joseph Jr. and Cash, uh, Cash Motor, uh, who is a partner with the firm, talking about the, their school design. So a little bit more uh, recent firm history. So in 1944, Oscar, at the age of 63, can you imagine that? At the age of 63, takes up roots and moves to Los Angeles with his son, uh, Oscar Graham Joseph Jr. 
to start a whole new firm there called Joseph and Joseph as well. Wonder where they got that name from. And then uh, in 1964, Oscar Sr. passed away at the age of 83. And then his son uh, died shortly thereafter at the age of 54, kind of sad, not very long life. Uh, Al Joseph uh, Sr. passed away um, in 1973 at the age of 95. Wait a minute, uh, yeah. And then Junior passed away in 1988. So here is um, Oscar's um, obituary. He is actually buried at Forest Lawn in Glendale, California. And, Os and his son is buried there as well. Uh, this is uh, Al Joseph Sr.'s obituary. And then Al Joseph Jr.'s obituary. It's a whole lot easier now looking up obituaries on the Courier Journal archives. Hopefully you all do that sort of, I'm not sure if you do that or not, but I tend to do it a lot. And thank goodness we can do that. Uh, this is their... Uh, this is Al Joseph Sr. and Jr.'s, and then Al Joseph Sr.'s wife's burial locations there in uh, Adeth Israel Cemetery, the Temple Cemetery. So today's Joseph and Joseph. So we're going from Joseph and Joseph to Motor and Motor, as I call them, the M&Ms. Thank goodness, they, I, I'm thankful that you kept the name Joseph and Joseph. But Cash Motor, the, uh, the patriarch of the firm, a little history on him. And he came, he was a structural engineer, designed most of the structure for their projects. And then Merrill Motor, his history, and Merrill joins us here this evening, but uh, he recently retired a, a few years ago from the firm. And this was our uh, Forgotten Foundations trolley tour when we visited the uh, Joseph and Joseph office, looking at the linen drawings. I think that was at the Rialto that we were looking at. As you come into the Joseph and Joseph firm, um, they have a nice little historical display of their projects and their, the awards and some things. This is the office as it exists today. Very nice office. Okay, here we go. Now, you, most of you should be able to answer this question. What was located in this building previously where the Joseph and Joseph office is? 550 South 4th Street? It's that red brick. What? Not Bix. W.K. Stewart, yes. Hopefully everyone is sure. For those of us at our age, we should remember that. Love w, everyone loved W.K. Stewart's bookstores. Just phenomenal. And they, yes, they are. Look, Joseph and Joseph is there in that building. And by the way, one clue was right here. You see all the bookshelves. In the, <laughs> I wasn't going to mention it at the time, but I'll go back and look at it. Yeah. And so uh, some more recent Joseph and Joseph, as I was telling Cash here earlier today, um, they're really into extreme makeovers right now. I just showed you Angels Envy, what they did there, what they did with the Port Nelson building. They're renovating the old Bacon's building there on St. Matthew's, uh, Shelby Low Road. We still, as Louisvillians, still call things where the old Bacon's was, where the old White Castle was, where things were, but it's... But it's getting an extreme makeover. Of course, there's the old bacons there. And that's what it's going to look like when it's done. You'll never guess what it once looked like. Here's another extreme makeover that they just completed. Uh, the Grocer's Ice and Cold Storage Building. Take a look at that because you'll never believe what they did with this. So um, you look at it and say, well, Steve, golly, you know, it's, yeah. they added on that, those upper floors. That is not original construction. They add, that's all new construction from that lower level up. And it looks like that now. 
So all of that was new construction. Just phenomenal. Fantastic job. When I was talking to Cash, I said, what, what happened here? I don't quite understand what went on here. And he explained it. I, I still don't get it, but it looks great. Another extreme makeover they're, they're in the process of doing is the old Joe Lays. They're going to do a hotel there, which hopefully will happen here sooner than later with the pricing and inflation the way it is. I know it's kind of challenging to pull off these buildings now, but um, anyway, that's hopefully will happen. And then the Dream Hotel, which there was a little controversy earlier this year on this, but uh, I think they pulled it off well. And uh, hopefully this will also uh, happen as well. This is the 800 block of West Main down near the Frazier uh, Museum. It would be great. And one of their newer projects, they're working on this a performance venue out of Jefferson Town. It was just on the news the other day. It's under construction. Looking forward to this. And as you may have heard, Joseph and Joseph has added another name to their firm. It's their Joseph and Joseph and Bravura. There's a photograph of the, of the firm. And I want to do a little tribute, and he's not here this evening, he's actually on vacation, but Jim Walters, I've known Jim for over 40 years, great mentor of mine, uh, worked with him when he was at Humana back in the day. And Jim just has, just phenomenal, all the architecture over the past, let me see, he started Bravura, what I want to say late 80s, 88, 89, Dave Newman, do you know when it, early 90s was it? Anyways, for 30 years, 30 plus years, he's been doing great architecture. Some more of the projects that they worked on here. And they actually did the old Forester Distillery, which I'm sure Joseph and Joseph wasn't too pleased about, but they're now together. And now they're in your portfolio. It's one way of getting that project. If it wasn't for Jim, I don't know if we would have this beautiful waterfront the way it was. He was the manager uh, to, to implement all this. Dan Church, I think, is here this evening. He he worked on all this as well when he was with Rivera. The Parklands of Floyd's Fork. Hopefully, everyone's been out to, to, to the Parklands. I still call it 21st Century Parks. I was on the steering committee for the implementation of this. But uh, just, ah, what a great thing. And then... I don't think either of these buildings would have been built without Jim's guidance and management of these, the Humana Building and the Kentucky Center for the Arts. Jim was very instrumental in all the detailing and implement and writing herd like you have to do on these type of projects, making sure they get successful. Now then, as, as I noted early on, there are a lot of historical markers out there locally, but there's not one here on Joseph and Joseph. There's one in Moorhead, Kentucky, as noted there, but we need to get a Joseph and Joseph historical marker here in Louisville at one of their prominent buildings, maybe a distillery or so. But uh, just a to-do list, a bucket list item for Joseph and Joseph. Hopefully one day we'll get that done. Um, Joseph and Joseph is now ranked as the fourth largest architectural firm here in Louisville. And my next architectural talk, I hope to be on William and Patrick Keeley, Architects of Catholic Churches. I've done a lot of research on this. Hopefully next spring, we'll do another lecture on uh, William and Patrick Keeley, who are very in instrumental in a number of Catholic churches here in Louisville, as well as nationally. Very well-known folks, and so I want to feature them at some point. So if you're interested in any of the books, you can see some of the books. And the quiz winners can come up and uh, go one through five. You can get to pick which books you want there on the front. And uh, then, are there any questions? Oh, yeah. Like so one of the questions is that I had is, why isn't Joseph and Joseph so well known or the historical documentation on them? Well, they're a very quiet firm, I will say that, um, and uh, very technically oriented, but they don't get out there and flaunt themselves like other architects tend to do. Uh, but uh, Joseph and Joseph, just they, they take care of business, they do quality projects, and they let their work speak for themselves, if you ask me. So 
that's one reason why they may not have as much historical documentation out there. And hopefully after tonight's presentation, we've, we've solved that dilemma for them. And there may be other reasons too <laughs> that we don't need to go that, into. That is correct, that, yes. Um, an, any, a, another question, another question would, would be, is there an architectural style that Joseph and Joseph uh, specialized in? Well, actually, um, they pretty much followed the style of the day, whatever the uh, traditional style was, uh, that's sort of the, the model that they followed. Uh, they they were not like, say, a Clark and Loomis that specialized in the Richardsonian Romanesque style or a Norm Suite that specialized in a uh, mid-century modern style. But uh, they pretty much very contemporary architects following the trends of, of today's design is the way I would catch it. Well, one of the things I'd like to know is how do we get a marker? <laughs> for Al Joseph and Joseph. Well, as some of you what may is know, the process. Well, the marker program actually has been on hiatus for the last few years. In fact, I thought it was going to restart this year, but they said now it's going to be next spring when they start it up. So they're not even taking applications, from what I understand, for historical markers. They're reworking the um, uh, the guidelines for the marker. We've had this little controversy about history revisionism of late, and they're going back and kind of tweaking the guidelines based on some of the controversies of the recent past. And so right now, even if we submitted a marker, we would not, but there's a process for that. And I've talked to Cash about that and maybe hopefully next year or the year after we'll get that done. Where does one apply for that? They're done through the Kentucky Historical the Society Kentucky Historic Heritage Council, or no, a Historical Society out of Frankfurt. And out of Brooks. Frankfurt. Yeah. And one of your questions was, uh, are there any images of the California office? I I right. didn't even that was know one that of the is, things. I you know, I did a lot of research one. trying to look for some of the buildings that the J and J office did out in California. From what I understand, they did a lot of governmental related projects, maybe some military. Again, they moved out there in 1944. I don't know what commission left. I'm certainly they had a commission to go out there and do. It may have been a military base or something they were doing project for. Again, the 1930s, early 1940s were not the best for architectural firms, very lean years. And so may, I'm certain that led them out there to do a big commission, but I do not have any images whatsoever of their California projects. And uh, perhaps this is uh, with all the competition around would be <laughs> uh, an inappropriate question, but I was kind of interested as to with all the history in healthcare and theaters and residential and distillery, where does the firm see it going the next itself going the next time? Cash, if you want to answer that, I'll let Cash answer that. <laughs> Thanks for a great question there. Uh, we're always looking for new commissions. So if anyone is interested, no, uh, we, we really uh, appreciate all our clients uh, that we're currently working for. Obviously, lots of distillery work that we've been doing over the past, you know, 100 years, but mostly you know, a lot over the past 15 years or so. Um, but uh, really, we see a lot of uh, hospitality coming to Kentucky, lots of in Louisville, uh, lots of opportunities off the distillery trail for a uh, hospitality industry, for hotels, restaurants, that sort of thing. Um, really see that as a growth potential for Louisville and Kentucky in general, really capitalizing on the distillery trail things. Um, but there's lots of opportunity, lots of opportunities in Louisville and, and the surrounding areas. We're really excited about the future um, and, and things coming out of COVID and the, the, the downtown uh, resurgence that's coming towards us, yeah. so pretty good. By the way, before uh, our next question, but I always, you know, people say, well, it costs so much. Why are you trying to save all these old buildings? All the, well, to me, as you saw the article in the Courier Journal, I say there's gold in those buildings. People are coming to Louisville, not so much to see our big glass box buildings, but to see our distilleries, which are located primarily in historical properties. There's only one or two, just a handful that are in modern structures like rabbit hole, but most of these are in uh, renovated structures. So urbanism has really saved a lot of buildings, uh, but a lot of economic development. If you go to a foreign country, I was just in France. I didn't go there to see the modern buildings. I went to see the Roman ruins, the Versailles. By the way, how do we say Versailles in Kentucky? Sale. <laughs> so um, anyways, uh, we go see things like that when we go to other countries. And that's why people come here to Louisville to see our historical properties as well. So there is economic development in those buildings. And we try to get that across to our civic leaders all the time. But they somehow like bulldozers for some reason. But anyways, we're working on that. 
all the time. Yes, question. Uh, hi, Steve. Um, my name is Teresa Heinzman, if you remember. I oh, live yeah. at the Commodore, and we're rever well represented in the back row there. <laughs> I have, I'm not an architect. I've never watched a building go up or anything else. So I have a very basic question. I'm our, I guess I'm our in-house historian because I've lived at the Commodore for over 40 years. And I've always wondered, um, all of our decorative elements um, on the outside of the building and the inside, um, I've always been curious. I'm assuming that they weren't specially designed for the Commodore, the, um, oh, the uh, terracotta, the ornamentation or, you know, and that they must have been some sort of a catalog that they were chosen from to decorate um, our building as well as others. How did that all happen? They didn't specially <laughs> design them just for our building. Well, well and, and you kind of wonder at times, for instance, the Conrad Caldwell House, which I'm very familiar with, has, a, and you look at those drawings, and uh, uh, Clark and Loomis just kind of indicated some things, but back then, they had some really artisans and craftsmen that uh, embellished those. Uh, I'm sure Clark and Loomis, or maybe even Joseph and Joseph, they had an idea of what they wanted to do, but then they worked with the artisans to come up with that design, and we somewhat, as architects, do that to this day work with artists uh, if we're wanting to incorporate a sculpture or a certain design feature within the building, uh, we'll call in a, a des designer to assist us on this. Cash or anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, Meryl? Most from catalogs. catalogs. Okay. Oh, okay, so they were able to pick and choose what they would like to add in. Yeah. I guess that, but I've never seen such a catalog before, so I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. But we had our, very right beautiful. back in the day, we had the German and the Irish craftsmen here, just phenomenal uh, woodworkings that they would do on the interior of these homes. Just, uh, and again, Al Spots with his house, you go over there, the windows still work properly, just the craftsmanship of those homes. They don't build them like that anymore, do they? Well, the, Joseph and Joseph does. <laughs> But we, we have time for one last question. Yeah. I, I noticed that uh, Oscar went to University of Michigan. Um, do we know what kind of training we can, do we know what kind of training was required um, or how they got their training in those days? Um, well, I know when, uh, when Al, Al, Joseph, Al Joseph Sr. went to Mel, and they did have a drafting architectural program there. I think Stratton Hammond went to that uh, same sort of uh, process. But uh, Mill High School had a really nice architectural drafting program that trained a lot of the uh, designers of that era. And it was amazing to me that I saw that Oscar had gone to U of M uh, back in the day and learned his craft there. But, was, it, uh, uh, was it just known that he, uh, just from family history, they had gone to Mill High School? Or did you have what's a that record? Again? Was there a record you could see that he went to Mill High School or did oh, yeah. family history or what? Yeah, happened? there's family history of that. Yes. Um, so, I was curious. But I do not know anything about his training, but I'm certain he went through the same design program as others had. Well, I, the reason I was wondering is because I was kind of from my own research is my grandfather at 17 uh, went to work at McDonald and Dodd in 1906. He was 17 years old. Wow. And um, I don't have any idea where he went to high school. I don't think he went to college that I know of. So I, that's why I was curious of what. Have you looked up his obituary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It doesn't say it in there. He, but he died, I mean, and he basically, it's. it's and you know, the Mail High School, Mail High School has their archives and they, they even have a history book on Mail. I would go there and uh, check out Mail High School. They have a great alumni association. I'm not sure if you've contacted them or not, but they might be able to assist you as well. But you could literally uh, kind of learn under on the job after you. That got is out correct. Of yes. Wow. Yeah, internship was great. That's the reason why I went to the University of Cincinnati. Had a great internship program and uh, worked with a lot of great architects. There back will back. be one final question from okay. John Bilderberg. Oh gosh, what time is it? Oh, well, I thought. <laughs> I thought it was a good uh, good question. What is the future of architecture? What is the future of your firm, Joseph and Joseph? What's the firm of the many architects here? I just got back uh, from Europe and with my family and uh, my cousins, all architects for some reason. 
And, um, but their big thing is they say they're coming back to America training um, architects here in Chicago, New York, San Francisco, how to build net zero buildings and, and in terms of reducing energy use. And um, I was just wondering an open question to, uh, to the, uh, our, our esteemed guests here and to, and to Steve, because you know, we have climate change and no one's mentioned that. And it, it worries me, there's droughts and uh, fires and heat, and we need to be more responsible in terms of energy use. And so I, I asked that question, not as a, in terms of a rhetorical question, but just a, a sincere, honest question. What's going on with that? Sure, if anyone wants to answer. Sure, I, mean, I think that's a great point. Um, I think, you know, uh, sustainability is a key factor in, in everything that we're trying to work towards today. And, uh, you know, the store preservation that, that Steve and, and our firm is passionate about and bringing, you know, using the most efficient buildings that are, are the ones that are already here. Um, so we, you know, that's a, that's one yeah. key point that's, that I think a lot of people overlook. Um, but also, you know, we've, we've got several buildings that we've done lead, uh, lead projects on. We have the first lead platinum home that we actually built with Habitat for Humanity. So there's lots of opportunities to do it for even low income housing. So something we're definitely passionate about and, and, and excited and definitely a good, good point. But okay. we want to thank you, Steve. Thank you. And I want to thank the audience. But this is an example of how interesting coming to the Filson Historical Society lectures are <laughs> and how you should come back and how you should join. And one last time, a major congrats. Thank you to you.